better um, the numbers, it's better we have it in more close quarters where we can have an even closer and a more intimate interaction in terms of questions, um, even comments as well. We will continue um, recording the session as we had promised so that we can have it up on YouTube a little later on. Now, in, in to start off this afternoon session, it will really be uh, Commander David as well as Commandant Balaguer. The Commander David will say, uh, will make a statement to open up the discussion, and of course, comments uh, can feel free to ask any questions that they may have. I think now is really a good opportunity. The rest of the afternoon session is yours, in effect. So now is a good time to ask all, any one of those little questions that you may have, um, or if you wish to make a, a comment or a statement, even a statement of solidarity, either coming from your branch or from your union, all of this is the afternoon session for you to do just that. So without wasting any more time, I'd like to hand over now to Commander David Abdul. Good everyone. When, when we were first trying to design this uh, seminar, we thought that in addition to the legacy of Fidel in terms of the achievements of the Cuban, we thought that in addition to the achievements of the Cuban Revolution, which we discussed this morning in terms of the development internally within Cuba, and secondly, with respect to the solidarity um, by Cuba and its people with other parts of the world, um, which as we heard from Commandant Balaguer was very central to the idea of the Cuban Revolution and of the thinking of Fidel, the, 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 the notion and value of humanity, of, of solidarity, that um, we should also take a look at the impact of the Cuban Revolution in terms of being an inspiration for movements in this part of the world, Latin America and the Caribbean, to bring about um, what has been described as another world. In other words, a world or a society um, which is not based upon um, the exploitation of labor in order to profit a few, but rather on the development of, of humanity. So, for many years after 1959, um, Cuba stood very much by itself, um, not only in the Caribbean, but right throughout Latin America and so on, stood very much by itself. Um, in terms of its model of development and in terms not only of its political system but also in terms of its economic system and of course the, what we heard today in terms of the benefits and achievements in terms of health and education and culture and sport and the development of young people and science and technology and so on. And then in the late 19... Well, let me back up a little bit. Here in the Caribbean, we had, of course, the Grenadian Revolution, March 13th, 1979, when Maurice Bishop and members of his political party, the New Jewel Movement, um, took power in a very peaceful um, way. Uh, they went into police stations uh, with guns that were not working um, in most instances, or had no bullets and said to the police, uh, we are now taking power, the police ran out police stations and so on to drop the uniforms. And within a matter of a couple of hours, um, people came out onto the streets and supported the takeover because they wanted to get rid of, of Eric Gehry, who they saw very much as a tyrant and, and someone who was a megalomaniac. So you had the Grenadian Revolution, 1979, and of course that ended tragically with the internal um, crisis in Grenada in uh, September and October of 1989, which eventually led on the 19th of October to the 
murder of Morris and many members of his cabinet, Jackie Kreft, Vincent Noel, Jameson Whiteman, Norris Bain, and others. Um, and then subsequent to that, on the 25th or 26th of October, the United States invaded Grenada. Um, and, and that was the end of that experiment, which gave a lot of hope to many people, particularly in the, in the English-speaking Caribbean, that we could have done something different to the, what was happening in the post-independence period or the post-colonial period of the English-speaking Caribbean. And then, and then in Nicaragua, also in 1979, um, and, and Sparrow has a calypso about 1979, um, it's a very, very significant calypso when he says, Idi Amin has gone, the Shah of Iran has gone, um, San, San, um, sorry, um, Somoza has gone, thank you, Somoza has gone, um, Gary has gone, and so on. And in Dominica, you also had the fall of uh, the then uh, Patrick John in, in was Prime Minister of, of Dominica. He also went in 1979. So, so Sparrow, go back, because all Calypso's chronicle a lot of, of not only local history, but, but international history. 1979 was a year when many leaders were deposed by, by movements and by struggles and so on. And so in Nicaragua, you had the coming into power of the um, San Inista National Liberation Movement, led by Daniel Ortega. Um, there was a very long guerrilla and, and, and struggle and, and, and mass uprisings and so on, general strikes and so on in Nicaragua, which led to um, Ortega and the San Inistas coming to power against a dictator who was Somoza. So there was a sense that, that there's some very famous photographs of Fidel and Ortega and Morris Bishop together, and also at that time with Michael Manley, who was also attempting his own type of reform in the context of Jamaica, and the Manley government was very close with, with Cuba and so on. So there was a sense of some things beginning to change in the Caribbean and, and Central America. At the same time, you had, you had in El Salvador, the Fargo de Marti Liberation Movement in El Salvador, which was also struggling against the dictatorship in El Salvador. And they were beginning to win that, that struggle. And then you had reversals. Um, and so I mentioned the Grenada one as well. And this is just a very quick summary. You had Grenada, of course. And then you had Ronald Reagan, uh, President of the United States, engaged, and you could Google all of this stuff and so on, engaged in what became known as the Iran-Contra War, where money was taken by the CIA, um, obtained from the drug trade, from the cocaine trade and so on, to finance counter-revolutionaries in Nicaragua and in El Salvador. And, and so, the eventually, um, the war in El Salvador had to come to an end because it was you know, virtually a, a, a stalemate in a sense given the fact that, that um, progressive forces were winning and then with the funding and so on and, and arming that Reagan provided through that um, through the use of drug money and so on um, that situation became one where the Fargo de Mata Liberation Movement could not advance and win and then in Nicaragua the Americans blockaded the harbor um, and engaged in a lot of economic uh, sanctions against Nicaragua as well as funding the counter-revolutionaries and that eventually also saw um, a, 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 a result of ending the war, those wars came to an end and they went into elections and the family, sorry, the French and San Sandinista and San Sandinista Liberation Movement did not win those elections, the conservative political parties won, won the elections. So Cuba then, once again, mid to late 80s, Cuba stood by itself in that sense, yes? And you had, at the same time, structural adjustment policies according to the IMF right throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, um, and you also had um, towards the end of the 1980s, the collapse of the Soviet Union 
and Eastern Europe and so on. And therefore, for many people from left political parties and people who engaged in struggles to try to bring about a different model of development um, and to break free from the control of U.S. imperialism, um, that those things marked a major reversal and a major setback. And of course, Cuba itself was under great economic pressure because its major economic trade was with the Soviet Union and the countries of Eastern Europe. And Cuba lost 50-60%, I think, of its GDP during what they call the special period and so on. So, towards the end of the 80s, um, Lula, trade union leader in Brazil, um, and the party which he led, the Workers' Party, they had been involved in political elections and so on, both at the level of, of, of cities, municipal elections, and the level of states, and also at the presidential and parliamentary levels and so on. Lula and Fidel had this idea of, of trying to bring together progressive people and parties and so on to discuss where, where the world was at and where things could move. And, and so the Sao Paulo Forum was created, um, bringing together left and progressive political parties. At the same time that that was happening, we saw in the late 80s and early 90s the emergence in Latin America of what have become known as social movements. Um, not just the trade unions, which were the historical social movements, but also movements of indigenous people, very importantly, of, of youth and students, of environmental movements, people fighting over land rights and so on. Um, movements mobilized against IMF and World Bank and, and, and the foreign debt movements around, organized around women and, and, and so on. And so these were not just NGOs which we are accustomed to in Trinidad and Tobago. So you have NGOs like NGOs in the, in the women's sector that speak essentially on International Women's Day on the International Day Against Violence Against Women, or when uh, there's gender violence and so on, they speak out of those things. But it is not a social movement in that they don't mobilize and organize lots of women to be involved in a struggle to get particular demands implemented. Similarly, we have youth organizations, but they're not youth movements that could galvanize thousands of young people around demands and, and, and around campaigns in their interest. So the distinction between NGOs and social movements, the social movements organize, raise consciousness, build movements around demands, and try to advance the interest through that, whereas NGOs tend to be engaged more in advocacy and lobbying and, and so on. So you have these very powerful social movements. And so together with the economic crisis throughout Latin America brought about by the kind of austerity measures implemented by the IMF and so on, neoliberal policies. You had a situation where po political parties or individuals became elected. And of course, Latin America has a different um, system of governance and trade and middle. We have the parliamentary system, which is Patterned after, it is not a replica, but it is patterned after the British system where you have elections for members of parliament to represent constituencies and then the leader of the party that has the most seats in the parliament becomes the prime minister who is the head of government. But, and then we have uh, a head of state who is the president who is not elected by direct vote and so on um, and is not a president that has a lot of executive power and so on. In Latin America, they have a system most akin to that of the United States, where you have the president elected by direct vote, and then you also have a parliament, both Senate and, and a, a chamber of deputies and so on, who are elected 
um, in various ways. So, you had coming into government, into the executive power, because it is the president that then has the cabinet that has the executive power, which is the government. You had coming into executive power, first of all, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, um, 19, um, what was that, 1990, 1989, 1990, was it? Um, sorry, 1999, let me say, 1999, Hugo Chavez was elected and so on, and took office in 2000. And then after him, you had elected into the presidency in Brazil, Lula, and I'm not going in exact chronological order, Evo Morales in Bolivia, um, President Correa in Ecuador, um, Daniel Ortega came back in and won the elections in Nicaragua. You had the um, Farbundi, Martin Liberation Movement that was fighting the guerrilla war in El Salvador. They won the presidential elections in El Salvador. You had a, a, a Roman Catholic Archbishop in Paraguay, Lugo elected in Paraguay as president. And then you had some kind of center of the road, like in, in Honduras, President Zelaya, and so on. And you also had in Uruguay a president, presidents who came out of the guerrilla struggles of the Tupamaros in, in Uruguay. So you had a series of, of shifts in the geopolitical map of Latin America, uh, beginning with Chavez in Venezuela. And at the same time that that was happening, of course, those presidents and their parties would have won either control of the parliament or in some cases got significant numbers of seats in the parliament. In some cases, they had the executive power of the president but didn't have control of the Congress. Like what is what happened with like Obama as president, as a Democrat, and the, 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 the Republicans control the Congress. You had so you had that kind of situation in some countries. And what what happened was that the, those who had this executive power then began to implement policies to redress the tremendous inequalities and, and, and discrimination that had existed in those societies for very many years. Huge poverty, poverty of 40 and 50 percent of the population being poor and so on. The problems of illiteracy, of lack of health care, a um, whole range of issues they began to address. And, and so major social reforms took place as well as constitutional reforms in many of these countries. And great successes and achievements were made in terms of, of improving the lives of working people and the poor, the unemployed, um, and so on. And in some cases, of course, I mean, I'm summarizing it and making generalities, the policies may not have been the same, but definitely not the same in each country, but there was generally approach to shifting um, wealth and income and distributing it in a more fair and equitable manner to benefit the masses of the people. Those are the general objectives. But we know that change and development and progress is never a straight line so that you, many times you go forward and then there are reversals. And so those who traditionally had wealth and power and privilege in Latin America, and if we think we have a 1% in Trinidad and Tobago, in Latin America, the oligarchies in those societies are much more powerful and much wealthier and so on, and much more entrenched than our 1%. All right, because the Latin American societies are much older societies than ours. Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad in particular, and Tobago too, is a much newer society in terms of our independence, in terms of our economic development, we are much smaller and so on. So in countries like Brazil and Venezuela and places like that, these oligarchs uh, were hugely wealthy, owned huge amounts of land, controlled um, the, the, the manufacturing sector, the, the, um, the import-export sector and so on. And because of their wealth and privilege, also controlled the political parties and believed that they that they had a right also to control the military because they would have sent their children to West Point and the American academies and so on to be trained, so they also controlled the military. So, so 
huge struggles would emerge because those with wealth and power and privilege are not about to give it up just like that. And they saw their wealth and power and privilege being threatened and eroded by all of these progressive changes that were taking place in Latin America. And then at a, a, a hemispheric level, the agenda by the United States, begun by Clinton, interestingly enough, to create what, what was known as the Free Trade Area of the Americas, which would have created from Canada down to Argentina, um, but excluding Cuba, a free trade economic area, which was to facilitate multinational companies being able to sell their products and services right throughout the region without any barriers of customs and duties, high customs duties and tariffs and stuff like that. And they would also get access to our raw materials for exploitation and, and a whole range of other things, uh, the details of which we don't have time to go into. Um, but interestingly, that free trade area of the Americas was set up in a way that all 34 had to agree. So if one country disagreed, there could be no agreement. And that was the actual DC. So when President Chavez became president of Hugo Chavez became president of Venezuela, then you had Luna and other people and so on. And the social movements were fighting against that free trade agreement. We here in Trinidad and Tobago were active in that whole process. We were part of the meetings and demonstrations in different parts of Latin America, in Miami and elsewhere and so on. Against it, I myself was in Miami protesting. I was also inside because I was part of the Minister of Trade's delegation, so I was inside and I would go out and share information about what was taking place inside with the people outside and so on and so on. So we were very much part of that movement. Those of us here, a few of us here in Trinidad and were and some organizations here in Trinidad and were part of that social movement. So the Free Trade Area of the Americas was, 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 was scuttled, it was crashed and so on. And so they didn't get away with that, uh, but they found political ways either uh, fair or foul to be able to reverse the progressive changes that have taken place. So in Paraguay, um, there was an incident um, that took place uh, where some farmers were attacked by the police or something like that. And the parliament then held President Lugo responsible for that personally. But he could not have been responsible for that personally, but they held him responsible for that. It's as if um, something happened in China and like you had 10 murders, and then you impeach the prime minister because there were 10 murders last night. I mean, you know, you can't really impeach the prime minister because there were 10 murders last night. He, was, he didn't want to shoot the 10 people, right? So that is the kind of thing that happened in Paraguay. Right? And in the space of two days, uh, one day in the, in the lower house and then one day in the Senate, they impeached President Lugo and removed him from office, even though he was a constitutionally democratically elected president of Paraguay. And they put their own person to be president, so they got rid of Lugo. And then in Honduras, a similar kind of thing happened where the Supreme Court then ruled against President Zelaya and said that removed him from office and so on. And then it was in Argentina, the progressive forces lost an election. In Brazil, you had the Congress impeaching Dilma Rousseff, who was a democratically elected president of Brazil. Now, Dilma uh, was accused not of stealing money, not of being corrupt, but of making a wrong report to the parliament and to the country about the state of the economy, which our ministers do all the time, right? They give a false report and say, well, we expect to get 2% growth because this and that is going to happen when we, we, we actually have minus 2% growth. The business students will understand the point I'm making. Yes? And then on the basis of that, they said that, that she was to be impeached. And they impeached and removed her. But the real reason why they wanted to remove her is because there was an anti-corruption um, drive in Brazil and the two most corrupt people wanted to protect themselves. One was the vice president, Tima, and so he figured that if Dilma was removed and he became president, he would get immunity. And the other was the head of the Congress, or main person in Congress, and he figured he could have gotten away. Well, eventually he didn't get away, 
and TV is only a matter of time when they catch up with it. Um, but as soon as they, in Argentina, you had a, a right-wing conservative government being elected, they started to retrench workers, increase prices, privatize, and so on, all of the policies that would put pressure on the backs of working people and the poor. In Brazil, um, Timor wants, wants to do the same thing. There's been a lot of resistance to that, and so on, including amending the trade union laws to make it more difficult for workers to join unions of their choice, and so on. Um, so you have these reversals. Um, and then, of course, Venezuela is like um, a kind of linchpin, right? You know, if you get rid of a key, a key um, part of, of, a, of a piece of equipment, the equipment will stop working. So Venezuela, because the Venezuelan economy, though not as big as Brazil, Venezuela is very important because of oil. Venezuela has the largest reserves of oil in the world, larger than Saudi Arabia. So obviously that is a huge um, plum for the multinational oil companies and so on. And so and because of the strength of Venezuela's proposals for alternative types of trade, um, which were mentioned this morning, and so on, the Bolivarian alternative for Latin America, which it was the alternative to the free trade area of the Americas. Um, the proposal of Petrocaribe, where Venezuela supported Caribbean countries with subsidized oil, and so on. So, many other programs like that of Latin American integration. Um, and and, and the, the ideas were being developed for a single currency in Latin America, the Sucre, so that you didn't have to depend on trading with the United States dollar and things like that. So there were lots of things there then that would have weakened the power of multinational capital um, and strengthened the power of, of, of governments and therefore the people of Latin America and the Caribbean. And so within Venezuela, there's, there have been these huge struggles between the opposition and the government. Um, and we have to have a, an understanding of the, the dynamics of those struggles. And this is the last point I'm going to make. And then we could open up for some discussion. And Colin Balaguer probably want to add because he knows a lot more than me. Um, but in Venezuela, of course, several things. Like in Trinidad and Tobago, the prices fell. So the economy um, would have been affected adversely by the falling oil prices because Venezuela, like Trinidad and Tobago, depends primarily on oil for its earnings of foreign exchange, for government revenue, and so much more. Um, secondly, secondly, because La the large oligarchs in Venezuela, the powerful oligarchs, controlled significant parts of the economy. Um, they were able to sabotage, in effect. In other words, if they didn't import or if they decided to hoard food, then the supermarket shelves would be empty. And then if the shelves are empty, people will get vexed with the government and say it's the government's fault and want to protest against the government, when in fact the food is not there because the people who traditionally imported and distributed the food decided not to put it there because they wanted the result of people getting vexed with the government. Yes? Um, if you imagine, for example, that for some reason the other Massey and, um, and, and, and all the other big importers, um, what, what's the guy up here now? Arima, um, um, by, by Ramaraj and so on, who was big importing up in Arima, and some of the other big food importers and so on, decided that they were vexed with the government and decided not to import on supermarket shelves. They started getting scarcity. People would start to come out on the streets and protest. But they're not going to protest against Massey and Malram and they, they protest against the government because it's the government's fault. So just imagine, you're just thinking about that, that is, that's the kind of thing that was happening. So you had that kind of economic um, of destabilization um, taking place in Venezuela. And of course, there are other factors and so on which were difficult for the Venezuelans to capital flight. Right now in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a shortage of foreign exchange, right? But there are some people who have foreign exchange. So that if you look at, the cent look at the Central Bank report and the review of the economy, and look at the deposits in the local banks, because it, it, you will see how much money is deposited in local banks in, um, in long-term, like fixed deposits, in short-term, um, like savings deposits and other kinds of deposits and so on. And you'll see the figures. And I, I, mean, I don't have it in front of me, but out of memory, 
about one quarter of all the bank deposits in Trinidad is US dollars, right? But we have a shortage of foreign exchange. So there is 3 billion US dollars, 20 odd billion TT dollars in banks in US dollars, but we have a shortage of foreign exchange. Yes? And some of the same business people that so on um, own those US dollars. In fact, we can't be owned by money because we, we might have a $10, dollars, but they have $10,000 or $10 billion. So then they export the dollars. So it's capital flight. So they're banking it abroad in the hope there's a devaluation so that the amount of TT dollars that they would get would increase. And so their wealth would go up if there's a devaluation. So that kind of thing happened in Venezuela with huge capital flight. Right? Uh, but all of those things exacerbated the economic situation in Venezuela. And we have to be open and honest. The government would have tried to counteract those things with certain policies. Many of them didn't work. Right? And so that also has contributed to the difficulties in Venezuela. But the primary things have been the factors outside of the control of the government. So in this situation, and then you have Trump coming in now threatening military intervention and so on. And the opposition went on the streets to protest and protest and protest, but it wasn't widespread, it was only parts of Caracas and a few other states. It was not in Venezuela. Um, and they say Maduro is a dictator, but Venezuela has had more elections from the time of Chavez to now. We have had about three times more elections than Trinidad today was at. Right? So I was there in October and I saw the elections for the governors of the states. I went into polling stations. I saw it was being done. It's actually a fairer system than ours. Time doesn't put me to explain that now. It's actually a fairer system than what we have. So there are elections. In a few weeks' time, we will have elections for, for mayors and, and municipalities and so on. And next year, there are presidential elections. So there is democracy alive and well in Venezuela. But they're trying to get a pretext for the United States to intervene. Uh, because if, if they could get, a, if the United States could get a government in Venezuela that is favorable to it, then um, having got rid of the Workers' Party of Brazil and the progressive people in Argentina and Paraguay and Honduras, if they could get rid of Venezuela, then it would just be Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua, El Salvador. And of course, El Salvador and Nicaragua are smaller countries, much bigger economies. And if that happens, then what do we have? We go back to where we were in the 1980s, where Cuba would be all alone once again in terms of its model of development and so on. So, in this situation, of course, it is always dynamic. It is never one-sided. And so there are people who are organizing to, to, to come again in Brazil. So Lula could run again for president, and he's number one in the polls, and so on. And in Argentina, people are on the streets protesting, workers who have lost their jobs, and so on. They are protesting, so Argentina is active. So there's, it is a dynamic. There's always a dynamic, and so on. Um, but we have to recognize that that there are opportunities and challenges, there have been successes and victories, and there have been reversals in terms of trying to bring about the ideals of Fidel. We're not talking about replicating, and the Cuban Commons this morning said that, they're not trying to replicate any model, but replicating the ideals of the Cuban Revolution, which ideals are that every single human being can develop to his own her full potential and that the country can be independent and pursue its own path of development and have its own system of governance and economy and so on and engage in relations of solidarity one with another um, as Cuba has done. So I want to stop there, I've gone a little bit too long but hopefully I've just given a little description of some of what and I've, I've, I've gone into some more history, particularly for the younger people. A lot of what I may have said, you may not have been familiar with, either because you were not alive um, at that time, because in, 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 19, in 1980s and so on, when the Sao Paulo Forum was started, you were not even a thought, right? Not even a thought in the 1980s, right? And so I went to tell the history like that so that you get a sense of how things have progressed and some setbacks, but that there will always be a forward motion because the human spirit is a spirit that wants more freedom and 
wants to always throw off the yoke of exploitation and oppression. Thank you very much. David, I thought that the history was, was important. And just to say, in the 80s, I actually was very, 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 very young. All right, so let us just thank the students who stayed an extra mile just to hear that uh, last part. Let's give them a round of applause for Pleasant Hill Secondary. And of uh, course, one of the things that we would like to do, um, Mr. Ali, the teacher, I would like to. I would like to really pay a special recognition to the teacher who, um, brought, who made sure he brought students to uh, the post-election forum, I think it was. Um, and I, I saw him at a tutor function when we had invited the school to the post-budget forum and he was most distressed that he, they, 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 could not, they did not participate, right? So we, oh. made, we made sure that we made contact with the teacher directly. Um, because I think as he's one of those few teachers who want to make sure that his students are exposed to alternative ideas, different ideas. So I'd like to recognize the teacher for bringing out these All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What we like to, so what we like to do now is just open up the floor for any comments and or statements and or questions. Uh, oh, I, I think the teachers from Maruva, you also have to leave. Let us also recognize teachers from Maruva who made sure they come here and be here. All right. So we like to open up a little bit the floor um, for any questions and or comments. Come on, see. Yeah? Come on, come on. We, have a, we have a comment coming from Tobago. I want to say, I want to comment, comment Abdullah, how we look, but that is that history, that history. Come on, you have, you have plenty. You ain't giving us the right amount of age. <laughs> <laughs> that is good, that is good. I know you have that, but that's what I want to say. All right, good. Yes, come back well, right. well, if you could ask Comrade Abdullah to put together some of what he said and use it circulate to our members, younger members and so, and claim ownership of it, we just printed David Abdullah, you know, and let us know. I was not present very early this morning due to legitimate reasons, and um, I just wanted to say that um, one of the questions that was asked this morning I felt it was a very pertinent question. I think it's one of the students that asked what 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 um was the greatest contribution I think Fidel made also. And of course Fidel made so many contributions, but <clears throat> I think that when, when that topic comes up, it is always a difficult topic to deal with. But I just wanted to maybe make some just a few comments. I, I, to me, if, if I have to answer that question, I would say to me, what the Cuban Revolution did was to provide to Latin America, in, in the Caribbean, of course, and indeed the world, especially the developing world, <coughs> provide to the peoples of the of Latin America a a new, a, a, an alternative method, a different method of economic and political relations are different, it's different, right? And um, parties like us, when I say us, I mean the MSG. Apologies if anybody is I don't know. For example, I was hearing um, our arch enemy, Ralph Maraj, the guy is on your station too sometimes. Talking about the need for a third party and how many people want a third party, but of course when he talks about MSG, he says, well, MSG wouldn't get anywhere because it's um it's more interested in Cuba, it's pro-Cuba and that kind of thing, right? But of course he would never characterize UNC and PNM as being pro-Washington or pro-America. You see, that's the that's the, the intellectual dishonesty our these fellows, right? But but I'm making, the, I'm making the point that that to me, to me, the question of an alternative. You see, <clears throat> people like to 
beat around the bush. We as trade unions unite to complain about the exploitation from the employer. But when we talk, many of us are not strident enough in talking about the new approach, which is socialism. You may not want to say, you may, not, you may want to be back to be creative. The social justice thing is strong too, and so but I think more and more we speak to people, we must talk about socialism, and it's sad. I think it's sad that so many of our trade union leaders today don't. I remember uh, Tiwu. They will remember a long time when you went to Tiwu office in Tongue. You see, socialism is the answer. But then the S drop out and the M drop out and then the whole thing, and they never put it back up. And look at what Tiwu is today. Look at what that proud organization called Tiwu is today. You know? So um, I, I think that that question of Cuba providing an example of an alternative path for development, I think that that is something that we can't get away from. And in terms of freedom itself, when, when Castro made the point of debt forgiveness, that the capitalist, the imperialist, and as he said, the imperialism must forgive the debt. And, and you know, he always said that capitalism and imperialism was irrational. He was making the point that if the debt is not forgiven, it would be even difficult for the capitalists themselves, the imperialists, the imperialists themselves, to sell their goods. Because you had markets, you had economies that were so strangled with this debt, like a yoke around the neck of, 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 of the people. And they were not able to, in fact, import goods and do all other things that economies are supposed to do. So I think that question of debt forgiveness and reflection, because you know, when Castro talk about the forgiveness of the debt, a number of right wing economists so critical of him. But in a year or so after, I think, I, I hope my math is correct, the Pope, the Catholic Pope, came and said the same thing. The same thing that Castro was saying as a socialist. Castro, in fact, uh, was vindicated, I would want to say, on the moral altar. Those of us who go to church on Sunday, like me, you know, was vindicated on the moral altar by the Pope coming and saying, no, you need to forgive the death. And I think that, that contribution of Fidel in terms of his view on the debt is very, 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 very important. And then for people in the Caribbean, a lot of us in African roots, the role that Cuba played in Africa in terms of the defense of the African revolutionaries, in terms of Cuba's contribution towards the destruction of apartheid in terms of Cuba's defense of the of national independence in the newly liberated and the, the colonial states of Africa. We, 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 we cannot say enough about that. We can't say enough about that. Because there was a, a comrade by the name of British, I don't know if you ever met him, comrade. Um, I used to work with, um, with, with, um, not with, Telco, right? Yes, he had a whole comment there. And he had something called, um, I think, some friendship organization. And he used to show some videos. I don't know what became of them, but what, in one of them, I always remember him inviting me to his home one day, somewhere in Tunapuna, he said. In Tunapuna? Yeah. And he, there was this video of what, what was called the Battle of Kuno Valley. I think that... Kino Kino Valley. Kino Kino Valley. And, and in it, the, 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 the person who was speaking in the document, she was saying that here it was that the South African tanks were faced with Cuban tanks and Cuban fighters along with the Angolan fighters. And, and instead, Instead of the South African planes being in the air, they were on the ground. And instead of the South African tanks being on the ground, they were in the air. And, and, and that, that to me sort of um, encapsulated 
what Cuba did. And what I want to say finally, too many of us believe this bullshit. And I don't know why it's Spanish for that shit, man. That it was because of the Cold War that the Soviet Union somehow got um, the Cubans to go into Africa and do all of that. No, 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 no. no, no. We need to reject that. We need to reject. Of course, the Soviet Union had its um, its geopolitical uh, interest to serve as any superpower, as they call it in those days. But in fact, I am of the view that if even there were no Soviet Union, the Cubans would have found a way to help us. So, though the comrades in the PPP did not understand our role, but we had to support Bonham in that respect. Because when the Cubans needed to be refueled to go to Africa, that same bastard Bonham, who of course who, uh, uh, gave our comrades in the PPP a hard time, but allowed the Cubans to land in and to be refueled in Timeri Airport so they could make the journey to Africa. So I, I, I want to say that um, I thought those my, those are the comments that if I was here on time, Comrade Davis, those are the comments I would have made because I, th I think it is important for us not ever to forget the role Cuba has played in showing us a new path, the sacrifice they have made, not only for them but for us. Uh, the question as to the world, the, 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 the influence Fidel Castro had in world politics. Because I remember that last time when he went to the UN. The, the, the UN assembly was packed, it was filled. Because there are, if, there, there are many prime ministers and presidents, when they go to speak in the UN, you have quarter, half, half of the place full. When Fidel Castro came to talk, the whole place was filled. Because of course, the progressive and the left-wing countries were there. And the right-wing countries really also wanted to hear him too. That was important. Though there are many imperialists who attacked Fidel, they always wanted to listen to him as an intellectual, you know? And, and uh, I'm saying the role he played in Africa and Cubans played in Africa, all very, very important. And finally, let me just say as a man, I remember visiting Cuba on two occasions. Sadly, the first time I visited Cuba, was at a time when the Grenada Revolution was in crisis, you know? And I, I remember on one of those occasions, somebody mentioning that Fidel was doing a degree. I said, a degree for what? <laughs> what is Fidel doing a degree for? He has so many degrees. He was doing some medical degrees. And I think a journalist asked him, well, why are you doing this? He said, because Cuba is entering into a field. Let's just show you the the, the demand in the Castro. Feel uh, Cuba was entering into a phase where it was developing biomedicine. Biotechnology. Biotechnology. And it had to do um, the negotiation with some foreign medical firms. And he had to be involved in that. So he had to know that stuff to be able to negotiate. And he did that, that on that next degree. For it. So um, I want to say that um, he will always be an inspiration to the world, no matter what the imperialists do. True. When the history is read, because it's written, when the history is read, they cannot erase. No Reagan, no Thatcher, none of them could erase the name of Fidel Castro. leader within the progressive trade union movement and as I said earlier today he has always been a staunch supporter of the Cuban revolution and in that fact a staunch supporter of alternatives to capitalism to imperialism and this is why he had served as chair of the MSG for a number of years that is of course comrade Vincent Cabrera namesake of Ramon Balaguer Cabrera um, let me just, you raised the point of um, 
Cuba's role in Africa, and I'm really happy you added that part about the myth of the Soviet Union, or some, you know, the reactionaries talking about the Soviet Union. But we have, we didn't recognize him in that capacity, but we actually do have a, a, a soldier from that period, and that is the ambassador himself, Guillermo, um, <laughs> he, he fought in Angola. I just want us to recognize the ambassador. He, he was an important commander in the Angola struggle. So when we talk about it, and this is not, it is not myth, so I'm glad you raised it. But right here in flesh and blood, we have a, a freedom fighter who fought, actually fought in Angola. <laughs> <laughs> You're still coordinated? <laughs> okay, great. There's one point um, that Vincent raised about, about Burnham allowing, allowing um, the Cuban planes to refuel in Guyana. They had first approached Eric Williams yeah, and yeah. the Trinidad Bay government. And the Trinidad Bay government said no. I know this, I know this, I know here. And as a result of that, Burnham said yes, because of course, the distance between Trinidad and Africa is not that great. Guyana is a little longer, right? So the short of, the shortest point would have to, to, between the Caribbean and, 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 and uh, the southern part of Africa would have been would have been Trinidad. But William said they want to get it. That's just for historical record. All right, you open it up again for yes. That. Good afternoon again, comrades, and to the little Spanish hello, buenos, buenos tardes, <laughs> right after. Well, my wife is Venezuelan, but I ain't learned much yet, so next time. Anyhow, um, comrade Cabrera raised a point about the third party, right, and I, as myself, who went up in 2013, also 2000, and 16 in our local government elections under the movement for social justice in my area where people telling me they are aware of my activism because it's over 20 years now I've been an activist in different ways and but I'm 36 years so that's in before 16 years I've started right um but people saying yeah you know you yeah, Daniel George is that and the other but I am PNF to that dead Right, and now, that is why I will re-emphasize again on the point I made earlier on downstairs, the need for us to let our children know what we know, the reason why we fight so that later on they will understand the need to be in men like this. Now, if we walk in to go anywhere, walking on the road, I'm talking about my daughters are five and three. From the time we start to walk, they believe they have to start to sing solidarity forever. <laughs> no, I tell you, serious, and the words, a lot of us as comrades do not know the words for the song. I actually, my daughters could actually sing verses, not just the chorus, yeah. or solidarity forever, verses, they hold the fort, for we are coming, right? But while they don't yet know the meaning, I intend to be teaching them, right? My wife started to understand the meaning of the songs, and actually going through the songs, it, it even raised my consciousness more. And you know, all these songs are available on the internet. I Googled to get those songs. I didn't get them in no, no union book or anything like that. And I have them on my little me two of them here. I don't mind it small, I just be going through it with this singing to them. Right now, the point I want to make is that Plenty of the people who say they are PNM till they die or UNC until whatever. They don't even know the, the reason why they're in that. Sure. They don't even know the reason why they're in that. And if we go in and tell them people about a third party or the only alternative, as we say, we have to know the reason and we have to get them to know the reason. But when they see it, they grow into something and already that already season in the brain. It's hard. So for the younger generations who come in fresh, if we don't teach them the right thing, somebody will teach them the wrong thing, and when they get accustomed to the wrong thing, it's hard to change. Okay. It's always hard to change. 
You could go up learning the right thing and it's easy to jump into the wrong, isn't it? But you see to jump from the wrong into the right, that all is hard. So comrades, I just want to plead. I wouldn't go down on my knees, I ain't going down on my knees for nobody for nothing. But I want to beg all you to get the young ones around all you involved, get them to understand the reason why we are here today, the reason why we are we were around four weeks or four years ago, and the reason why we plan to continue with this struggle. And then they will see the need for the alternative. They will start to move towards it. You're, you're traveling in Africa, or you just happen to get an opportunity to talk to somebody you don't know, bring up the topic. Bring up the topic because we'll chat about things that are making sense, right? And we, we know what the person we might see them next week in a taxi. We wouldn't see them again tomorrow or next year. We might never see them again in life, but at least leave them with something positive to think about. Yes. When we made our intervention, we ended with Fidel's uh, in the seventh Congress. And we often use a lot of things of a lot of military tools we often use. We think that uh, you all and us, we are very clear of what has happened up until today. The history that has passed, the moments that have passed, everything that uh, has a lot of history and a lot of meaning, everything that has happened up until today. That's why if you heard clearly, when I translated what Fidel said, And for us, at least, he interprets it this way. Fidel there gave us his last fighting word, his last uh, ruling. 
nos dijo and he said Cuba will win he's telling us to have confidence in ourselves to have confidence as Cuban revolutionaries and for that he said Cuba will win that's why he said it's important to talk about what, what are the Cubans going to do what is Cuba going to do and what are Cubans going to do with all other revolutionaries to try to achieve that answer that Fidel tried to instill in us before he left that's what he tried to instill in us he has thought a lot about this and there's one initial point that, that has to do not with a dream but with his vision to achieve what he wanted to achieve where he wanted to be that doesn't have to do with our eventuality but it has to be very but it's very strategic so that what we trying to achieve it remains there in a way that there's no way that you can move back from that you can go back and that is and there's one principal matter in this our nations in Latin America and the Caribbean in different times in all Latin America liberated and independence they were liberated and they gained independence against Spain other countries from here with France, others with Britain but the truth is that we have a community that in practice we have the same interests and we have the, uh, the same futures and objectives and the and to, and to be able to achieve everyone's strength and to be able to gain what we have to do we have to work together to gain that uh, strength in each other and of course especially talking to the parties of the left that feel the pain of the, on the struggle of the lower class or the, the humble that fight for that that fight for that change in the world and that fight for that right that everyone is entitled to the same guarantee of a future to have fraternity and solidarity with all human beings Abdullah also spoke about this. And at this moment, we have a, a danger with the plan of uh, other specific, uh, Cuba and other specific nations. Our countries, Latin America uh, in general as well, when we gained independence, what we really had was the independence of Spain from that uh, part of the independence so from that independence up until today under the dominance of the United States under the interests of the United States and you can see that in history 
where each uh, country of Latin America, in one way or another, in any way. Had uh, a government that tried to uh, benefit their their public, their nation. That tried to move away from all the other interests that uh, were trying to tie them. That was uh, sufficient for a, a long time. From coups. Which, which was um, supported by the United States or other countries. In Argentina, in Uruguay, in Chile, in Paraguay. In Peru, in Brazil, in Colombia, they had pools that uh, were tied to this. And in a, in one point or another, there was uh, a time that it, it just didn't exist. And then there was a moment that they had the a the missing or a separation. And at this moment is when the United States became a, a potential uh, in the world. The, the left side then of, of uh, the left side of all the parties they weakened they started to disappear at that time Cuba was the only one that remained working and fighting to uh, achieve that socialist and socialism it was a very difficult and complicated situation and something that was very um, that didn't fit in the mind to some is when it started to happen you have uh, Commander Chavez and then a lot of interesting things started to happen in Latin America we have a few elections that came out in which in Ecuador they had a government that was with all the social movements in Bolivia an indigenous person got presidency which is something that is something that is uh, not believable for many countries, exa exa for example, the United States, what they don't think that uh, the betterment of the people is in mind, is what they strive for. In, in Bolivia, it kept growing and it was one of the biggest groups in Latin America. There's Brazil also. In Argentina, they had a nationalist government. And something very interesting started to uh, produce and become a part of something. Which is a part of this uh, very incredible process, and Cuba, which Cuba is a part of, and other Caribbean islands. Where it, is pro where it is proposed as a sweat of strength that in practice, inevitably, 
it constitutes a strategic objective for Latin America? An objective that once you think about it, and if all uh, all of us integrate, it, some it really gives us our independence and our sovereignty. Which has a lot of interesting traditions and history that we and that shows that we can achieve it. In the Caribbean, the CARICOM was formed an integral uh, an element of integration between the countries that are complemented in, in, the, in terms of economics and all these different aspects in Central America. And in South America, you have Mercosur, all these different all of these, all of these are associations of integration. And it is achieved in, for the first time in Latin America. The CELAC, which is all the uh, Central and Latin American and Caribbean states. That it begins a process, uh, a procedure of a lot of interest. And you see actions that are very, uh, that work with solidarity between all these countries. And then uh, Mercosur, UNASUR, all these, play, all these other organizations. It obviously it's created with all the conditions for all these for all these uh, in, for all this integration to be able to uh, come about uh, starting with the select and with the help of select starting with political strategy but there are others as well. And, and that economic and strategic strength and politic, political strength that we can achieve and uh, we, we will get it through that integration and that uh, true uh, independence and for us to become true sovereign nations we will get once we cut that in that dependence that we have on the United States that it, it's a political and economic independence and once we don't break that we would not be able to actually achieve what we want to achieve And an example of this dependence that the U.S. wants to have uh, over us is what you see happening in Venezuela right now, how they are trying to intervene in their internal conflicts. You can see what the same happens in Brazil, in Honduras, in Paraguay, in all these different um, countries where they try to not necessarily um, invade in or start a war with weapons, but they try to get a sense of desperation in the people, in the towns, for people to um, begin to hate and to create hate. And you start to see that desperation in the people, and that's what 
they, they, they are trying to do and they are trying to achieve. And the second summit of the CELAC, which was celebrated in Havana, the proclamation was approved of Latin America and the Caribbean as a peace zone. And in, in that proclamation that was approved at the CELAC meeting, there's a, a, a paragraph that states that every nation is entitled to choose their own uh, political system, any, uh, any social, political, economic system that their, their peoples choose. And if you realize that paragraph is a paragraph of independence and sovereignty, and that paragraph, um, independence of those, whoever is in power, whoever is the head of state, they can still achieve that social, political, cultural integration. So that, so, and that integration is also, you can uh, have it in a social, economical, technological way that, that once you achieve that integration, it would have places like the United States, they would not be able to intervene and they would not be able to have so much power over these nations. What characteristic would this integration have? It would be a community of 600,000 uh, persons. Uh, anyone that has a sense of economy, you would know that 600 million, you, uh, it would show the, the economic, it, it would help towards that. You would understand. Only China and India can, can grasp. Europe doesn't have 600 million uh, habitats. All the gas, petroleum, that uh, all these things that all our nations need with respect to energy, oil, petroleum, all these things would be produced right here in, in this zone. With respect to food, we would be able to have everything on our own. We won't have to depend when it comes to food and uh, agriculture, animals, all these things. We would have it right here. And water resources for 200 years. With the amount of water that can exist between our nations, the validity to consolidate this as a uh, strategic objective and something more uh, noticeable is produced. You all know that uh, the United States had a summit of the Americas. Summit of the Americas that in which Cuba was not a part of. And this, is, and this is what I mean by when I say, and you would realize the solidarity, the strength that solidarity has.
a group of all these nations that were part of the summit. They insisted that Cuba had to be in the summit of the Americas. And they had to invite Cuba, and Cuba was present. And the possibility uh, was uh, inevitable, and it was created. And it, it was expressed by countries for the Cuban president to speak, especially to the U.S. president, to explain Cuba's position, their thoughts, what Cuba was for. In that example, that has a maximum interest. The possibility that can come about from that solidarity, the strength that can come up. And earlier in the meeting this morning, he expressed with a lot of passion the meaning of solidarity and the meaning of solidarity between our nations. In this case, solidarity with our nations and uh, between governments. And all this. Solidarity, it, it runs a risk in what the United States is trying to do against, for example, uh, what the damage that they are trying to do, for example, in Venezuela, and that fear that they want to invoke in everyone, and they are trying to stop Venezuela from becoming a true sovereign and independent nation. And for us Cubans, this is very essential and very important because of what we spoke a moment ago. Those were, that was one of the fights that uh, Fidel fought so much for, and he, with so much passion, it was the integration of Latin America and Caribbean. And it was in this that Fidel and Lula spoke about, and uh, uh, they had so much passion about this that they decided to come up with the Foro of Sao Paulo. It's, it's a place especially where the parties and the movements of the left can come together, can work together, can be unified. That, that's why in that, uh, the main importance of that comfort of that forum is uh, the unity of the parties of the left and the movements of the left. It doesn't mean that they have to give up their own uh, unique ways and, and their ways of thinking. But to try to achieve this strategic objective and to join and work together to achieve the main strategic objective. <laughs> Uh, integration, because they know that once that unity that comes from the left side, the right side, would no longer be as effective or as powerful as they are right now. 
primer lugar se analizaron se trató de aumentar la, la concepción de las nuevas medidas económicas que debían aplicarse en el país. So in the first place, it was, an the, uh, it was analyzed the situation um, and the conception of new economic measures that had to take place in the party. It has, it has an economic um, aspect and it, from there you kind of realize what do you want as a country or concept and it's defined this is part of the uh, response of what uh, Fidel was fighting for fight for the nation that we are trying to achieve and that we are trying to construct is an independent and sovereign nation. Socialist and democratic. Prosperous and sustainable. From before, it was defined. The uh, elements of the establishment of the diplomatic relations between U.S. and Cuba. We uh, ask and we uh, beg the United States to respect that the relations that are going to occur between the U.S. and um, Cuba has to be uh, respected, it has to be um, adequate uh, to say normal relations. And to have normal relations, we have to end the, blo the embargo blocking. You have to get back what And you have to try, and you have to take back these submissive actions that you uh, had, that you took against Cuba. And he's worried that he's tiring you all out. <laughs> Life has a lot of things. 
que a veces una cosa que uno hace hoy, posiblemente mañana tenga que hacerla diferente. That, let's say today we do things this way, but maybe tomorrow we have to do it a bit differently. Porque el momento histórico es distinto. Because the historic moment is different. La revolución cubana es un ejemplo de eso. The Cuban Revolution is an example of that. The uh, historic conditions at that time of Cuba were completely different. After 50 years, the other, the, in Colombia, for example, that Con, that, that condition was different. In each historic moment, you have to do what is necessary at that moment. There's also Nicaragua, where they, they won in government, they lost, then they gained back the power. This is a very important element, and those are just three or four examples. When we fought against uh, Batista in uh, student rallies and student protests, there was a moment where we started to discuss, they said that we do or do we remain the same? Or what do we do? Is it that we have to do more? was talking to um, the public and he, and he once again he started the fight in Cuba then they had Fidel on one side and Raul on the other side while the battle was going on there comes a moment where Fidel and Raúl come together. Fidel asks Raúl how many arms he have left. He said only five. Five that you have and the two that I have now for sure we are winning this one. <laughs> For those that are accustomed to this type of life, uh, this military, that's something, that was something uh, very important, impossible for us. At that time, uh, Batista had over 80,000 weapons, he had tanks, he had all these different ammunition. When you think about that, everybody is like uh, shocked. But when you analyze that in time, that uh, 
it, it was on the war that Fidel was fighting. It wasn't with seven arms and oh, out of with, uh, fighting against 80,000 men or weapons. Fidel's strength was the... Fidel's strength was those seven arms plus the whole human nation backing him up and uh, supporting him in that fight. And that is how Batista was... Uh, they even had, uh, Batista even had a North American um, um, uh, backing them up and helping them. And this, uh, I use this example just to, so that you all can understand that in every historic moment you have to do what you have to do. It depends on the historic moment. Because in a moment where no one wanted to fight with us in a war against the United States, Fidel developed the military conception of the whole nation. And the, uh, it was uh, conceived and concepted that if um, we would start that war once uh, the U.S. surrounds us, and when the U.S. disappears, we had a, a special period that we, we would put, a special plan that we would put in action. And with a lot of issues that we had behind us, the country continued, Every everything continued. We developed. That's why Fidel puts in first place the historic moment. Then Fidel says, uh, the revolution is to change everything that has to be changed. And that also goes to the first point when we talk about a historic moment because uh, what one day might seem as this is a very good strategy at the uh, next point in another moment, it might not be the best strategy and we're going to have to change it. We're going to have to do things differently. It's uh, uh, liberty and equality. It's being treated and treating others as human beings. That's a very ethical value. It's one of the most fundamental ethical values. It's to emancipate for ourselves and to uh, ourselves and others with our own forces. No one, no one is coming to do things for us. We have to do it for ourselves. It's trying uh, to challenge those uh, dominant forces in and out of our social and uh, national environment. It's to defend those values that people think uh, that uh, they, we have a price to pay. This is what we mean when we say motherland or, or death. 
solidaridad y egoísmo. It's modesty, disinterest, solidarity, and uh, heroism. Es luchar con audacia, inteligencia y realismo. It's to fight with intelligence and realism. Es no mentir jamás ni violar principios éticos. It's to never lie or, vi or violate the pr principal ethics. Es convicción profunda de que no existe fuerza en el mundo capaz de aplastar la fuerza de la verdad y de las ideas. Es un elemento que tiene una fortaleza enorme para todo revolucionario como debe actuar, como debe actuar. It's a profound conviction that, uh, that the strength exists in, in the world that is capable um, to there is a world that is capable of destroying that, but we have to fight, we have to be stronger than that. There are a few things that um, we cannot say in certain moments. But everything that we have to say has to be the truth. Revolución es unidad. The revolution is unity. Es independencia. It's independence. Es luchar por nuestros sueños de justicia para Cuba y para el mundo. It's to fight for our dreams of uh, justice in Cuba and for the world. Es la base de nuestro patriotismo, nuestro socialismo y nuestro internacionalismo, otra cosa muy unida. Which is the base of our patriotism, our socialism, and our internationalism. Es imposible ser socialista si antes no ser patriota, patriotista. Si it's, it's, to... it's impossible to be a socialist without having that um, patriot, that patriotism, um, and that solidarity with our nation, our people. When we fought against Batista, we were fighting ag uh, against a dictator. But when we started to analyze more, we realized that that was not our fundamental we fought against Batista because he killed a lot of our brothers. He uh, oppressed a lot of our brothers and sisters. It's that sense of uh, solidarity with our brothers and sisters, our peoples, our uh, human beings. And a, a, and a socialist has to be a really a internationalist. You cannot be socialism without internationalism. It's not possible. For us, this is very uh, important, and this is what we follow to be able to continue our fighting for Fidel's legacy and for what he left behind. When Fidel passed, we carried him to the uh, cemetery in Santiago de Cuba. There's there are some rocks that I'm, I'm sure you all have seen in some pictures. You would see they are his remains. And on the right side of that rock, those, this what I just said is written on those rocks. All of this that is in it is Fidel. All this that I just said was his life, was his conduct, his attitude. That's why, please, I do apologize for speaking so much. But I wanted to explain this to you all. Because we talk about time and history. And in that history, we say there 
uh, in all of this, there's a historic moment. This is this is the time that we have to defend what he was about. This is the time, this is the historic moment where we have to defend and fight for all of this, all the past, the history. This is the time that we have to uh, unify and defend Latin America and the Caribbean and all our nations. And this reaffirms that there is no uh, small Caribbean or no country. There is no small party in the world. That there is no small party or small country that cannot defend their rights of the people and cannot defend their rights of the workers and we can never forget that there is, there is a moment that we have to truly understand the ones that can truly understand the will to fight and what we are fighting for, those are our workers. This is the moment in which we are in. Right now is in a plan, a development plan that will, uh, a 2030 development plan that will finish uh, developing next year in 2018. And to end, I just want to repeat what we are trying to achieve independence and sovereignty. Socialist and democratic. We understand that socialism is democratic. If socialism is not democratic, then it's not socialist. But in this world where the democracy is hidden and it's pretended that it's being, that it's being defended falsely, by the imperialism. We want to ratify that if socialism and democracy is its one. And prosperous and sustainable, which is the economic part. We have to develop our prosperous and sustainable nation for our peoples, for everyone. But that it's sustainable. That's all. Thank you.
consider the uh, aggression by imperialism, especially with Trump and the others, now more than ever, we need to reconfirm our commitments to fight for independence and sovereignty, for socialism and democracy, for prosperity and sustainability. And I think this is the legacy that Fidel would have left for us. And to say to you this, the legacy that you yourself, being someone who was in the struggle, have also left for us. And those of us in this room, especially our generation, our commitment is that that fight will continue. Now and for very long into the future. Because as Fidel said, Cuba will win. We can say Trinidad and Tobago will win. you take this with you back, not just to your workplace, but to your homes. So you talk to your family on the block, talk to your friends, in church, on the farm. Let us not keep this precious gift in these four walls. This gift must be spread throughout Trinidad and Tobago, as we ourselves create a new Trinidad and Tobago. And as the political leader of MSJ always said, and I think we need to reconfirm that we too have to now build our second republic. Yeah. So thank you, comrades. Thank you very, very much for making this historical journey with us. Now we have. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I don't know that I should be able to show you, but I'm here. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, I think coming out of the there's something that, uh, that what came to my mind this morning. And after the three sessions, it became a more crystal clear that the true expression of democracy, of democracy is socialism. Because the, the, the intelligence of democracy is supposed to be for the people and by the people. But what has been given to us as democracy and, and Catholicism is it to be for the classical contemporary example of it. The people would have voted for for what for, for democracy. And the irony of it, the irony of it that the European Union and the United States fought against democracy. So after hearing what was shared today, I believe that our understanding should really be the, the truest expression of democracy is social. JTAM, uh, bilateral, so the JTAM leaders, we will start, we we'll commence that in five minutes. Um,
Jason. Michael Manley, Maurice Bishop, Prince Charles, Fidel Castro. You know who missing? Che. Yeah. Matthew Manley. Commonwealth Secretary General.
Yeah. All right. Take your time and do quick. Peace <laughs> <It's> slowly. <laughs>